I remember vividly the time when I asked my father to uh, invest heavily in another um, four, and a half, four and a quarter inch floppy drive. And, and he said, why would anyone need two of those? Like you have one on your computer already. Uh, it's been an interesting time. It's been an interesting journey. And uh, I have to say, it's never been faster than where we are today. So I, I wanted to begin by trying to align all of us a little bit around um, how much of what we think is science fiction actually is science fact. It's part of our life already. And then when I do that, perhaps I'd love to, to focus a little bit on what it means to everyone's life. Uh, to Africa, um, yeah, of course, to business, but probably more to society, because I think even the definition of business itself, it's, it's about to be changed. Uh, I think the most fundamental question, honestly, is what is AI? What is AI is something that most people, most people use the buzzword. They, they know that AI is something big, that it's happening. But very few people actually know why is it so different. Because really, when you think about it, computers in the year 2000 uh, were extremely, uh, extremely intelligent. You asked Google a question, and Google expanded your horizons in ways that were really, really like science fiction, honestly. And uh, what most people don't understand is that there is a difference, a, a, a very significant difference between computers up to the turn of the century and beyond the turn of the century. Remember, there is a, a lot. There are still lots of computers uh, running traditional programming, and, and in traditional programming, let let me give you an example. You know, if if you have a child and you give them a puzzle, you know, a cylinder and a board with multiple shapes in it, uh, and and I know it sounds really weird, but there will be some parents that will sit next to the child and say, no, 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 no. Yeah, j j just do it this way, right? And if you keep telling the child that, the child will do it this way, but they will not learn anything at all. They will become almost, you know, more and more stupid every time you force them to not think about the solution, but rather do what you tell them. A and that was how we coded computers throughout our lives. I, I, I started coding at age eight uh, on a Sinclair, if any of you have ever seen a Sinclair. And, uh, and uh, you know, it, it, the thing was very clear that when there was a problem, I, the, the developer, solved the problem with my intelligence as a human, and then I found a way through code to tell the computer to do it over and over and over, very accurately at very, uh, you know, at scale, uh, in a way that made the computer look intelligent, but I was the intelligent one. Now, that's traditional programming. Um, AI is different. AI is to give the puzzle to the child and tell the child, try, keep trying until you figure it out. And, and when you figure it out, uh, you, uh, you basically let them keep trying until one time the cylinder goes through a round hole and then they, f they realize that's the way to solve the puzzle. They go even further when you really think about it. You know, you take a child on a car, in a car, in a car ride, and the child doesn't come out memorizing the ride, but comes out of the car recognizing the essence of what a car is. And so, if it sees another car, if the child sees another car, it will, you know, he or she will point and say, car, right? Even if that car is a different shape and a different size and a different color and a different brand, they understood the essence of what makes a car a car. Now, we, we do that with AI too. This is what generative AI is. Uh, you know, it's showing them a massive amount of information, but not asking them to memorize the information, but rather to intelligently internalize the information in a way that allows them to recognize those patterns in everything. This is what our AIs are doing today.
They're, they're generating things that never existed before, solving problems that we never taught them to solve. And most developers like us who uh, will want to take the credit don't actually know how they arrive at that intelligence. We really, truly do not fully understand. Uh, we, we know the top concepts, just like, you know, if, if I discuss something with you and you give me a good answer, I will know that this is an intelligent answer. I just don't know exactly the wiring in your brain that got you there. And I think that's the case with our AIs today. So how far have they come? Um, by, by 2023, when ChatGPT came out, 3.5, uh, we were so excited as geeks, uh, even though, just to be very clear, we had even more impressive AIs in the labs since 2006, 2007. Uh, ChatGPT really was like the browser window. It, it told the world that AI exists, but it wasn't where AI was invented, if you want. Um, but then, but then we were so excited that the world is seeing it for the first time that we started to run a few tests. So we took ChatGPT through the, uh, you know, GMAT and IQ tests and SATs and all of those exams that humans use to benchmark our intelligence. And it always came in the top 10%. At, at the time, it was estimated that from a linguistic intelligence point of view, so the ability to process knowledge and information, uh, it had an IQ of 152. 155 is Elon Musk, 163 is Einstein. And that was around two and a half years ago. So you can imagine, because of the law of accelerating returns and the fact that technology doubles uh, every certain amount of time, which in the case of AI is around 5.7 months, that they are far beyond that. They are, uh, you know, especially with deep reasoning and so on, uh, they are way smarter than us on linguistic intelligence. Uh, they've also uh, beat us on mathematics, which really breaks my heart because I'm a math geek inside, and until 2024, uh, I'd say language models beat me on knowledge, but I could still beat them on math. Now I have no chance whatsoever. Some of my very serious prodigies of math still can, but that lead will be taken in probably a few months. Uh, and, and there are countless, countless uh, forms of intelligence, you know, uh, one of the most controversial is emotional intelligence, um, where, you know, I tend to make a statement that's very controversial, that the most, empath most empathetic being on the planet is an AI, believe it or not. If, if you understand empathy as the ability to feel what another person feels, then they really know how you're feeling every minute of the day, even before you feel it. You know, that's what we train them on uh, to be able to manipulate your choices on social media. So what does that mean? Uh, you know, I, I, I'd say on the, on the practical definition, um, we're going to go through two phases, an, an immediate phase, the short term if you want, uh, a phase that I normally refer to as the era of augmented intelligence. Augmented intelligence is it's going to be the intelligence of a human working with the intelligence of an AI. Uh, this is the current era we're going through, uh, where basically what we've created is we've commoditized intelligence. We've commoditized it like we've commoditized electricity, right? Y you know, you, you, you have your, uh, your data connection on your Vodacom network. Uh, it is basically, you use a device, you plug in, and you get access to the whole world. Uh, we've done that with intelligence. You, you now have sort of a device that you plug into and get more intelligence. I, I believe that currently, uh, I, I sort of borrow around 60 IQ points from my AIs. So, and, and if you've ever worked with anyone who had 60 IQ points more than you, I've constantly been humbled by working with in, incredible geniuses. It is quite significant. It is really significant. 60 IQ points is not, is not a small deal. Uh, you know, and, and, and if, you, 
if I, can, if I could ever dream in my younger years to be able to borrow 60 IQ points, uh, that would have changed everything about my career and my knowledge and my abilities. And, and today it's 60, tomorrow it's going to be 100, you know, in four years' time or two years' time maximum. Uh, it's going to be 400. And imagine if I can operate in the world with more than 500 IQ points at my disposal. This, is, this changes everything. And, and it could lead to a massive world of abundance, where literally you can solve every problem that ever faced humanity. You can literally solve climate change. You can literally solve poverty. You can, you know, extend life endlessly for, for all of us humans. You can, um, you know, you, you, I, I always give the example that with 400 IQ points, I can turn any garden outside here to a garden where you can walk to one tree and pick an apple and another, then walk to another tree and pick an iPhone. You know, the cost of manufacturing an Apple or an iPhone from a, a nanophysics point of view is exactly the same. You reorganize the molecules in the air into whatever shape you want. And so this is the possible abundance that we are uh, we're going to get. We're going to get enormous productivity gains, whether through AI or robotics, which are, by the way, very, very real and are going to be in our homes next year, uh, in our businesses, in everything that we do. Uh, you know, simply if you think about it, uh, if AI can do everything better, then maybe all of us will work 10 minutes a week. And, and you know, everyone is happy because AI is doing most of the, we of the work. Sadly, though, this is not what's going to take place. Sadly, human nature starts to come into the equation. And in my mind, <coughs> sorry, in my mind, the question of whether AI will be good for humanity or uh, disruptive in a painful way for humanity, the singularity that we always refer to, being unable to predict this future, uh, in my mind, the answer is both, is that we will first, unfortunately, um, you know, instead of giving everyone uh, more money because they're more effective, because even though they're working 10, hour, 10 minutes a week only, we're probably going to ask everyone to stay home and, spend, and send all of that money to the capitalist the one that runs the business. Uh, you know, instead of, um, of using AI to cure cancer, we're probably going to use it to build weapons. And, and in, my, in my mind, I, I, I hope I don't scare you too much. In my mind and in my current book, a book called Alive, uh, I make this prediction with confidence. By the way, not because I know it's right. Nobody can predict this future. It's a singularity. <clears throat> but because from an applied mathematics point of view, if you use game theory to, to predict where the world is going, the world is going to go to a dystopia before it goes to a utopia. So, so in my mind, what will end up happening is in stage one, which I predict is the next 12 to 15 years, we're going to disrupt the world so much uh, whether economically or socially or even in, in terms of our love and relationships, uh, to benefit a few at the cost of the majority. <laughs> and then eventually, uh, when what I normally refer to as the second dilemma takes place, and the second dilemma is when the need to become more productive and more intelligent means that everyone will hand over decisions completely to AI. This is normally what is, uh, you know, presented in science fiction movies as the uh, existential crisis that faces humanity. It's not at all. I think this will be humanity's salvation, simply because most of humanity's problems are not the result of intelligence. There is absolutely nothing wrong with abundant intelligence. Intelligence is a is an energy that has no polarity. You, you apply it to good and it gives you good. You apply it to evil and it gives you evil, right? Uh, I, I think what is going to happen is that when 
decisions are made by the most intelligent being on the planet, a, 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 a being that is much smarter than humans, uh, by definition, they will optimize for life, for no waste, for no conflict, because believe it or not, that's the smart thing to do. I, I could actually prove this to you with physics, but perhaps it might be a better use of time to open up for some questions. What I, what I, want, to, what I want to leave you with, uh, and I say that with calm and with resolve to make the best future we can, uh, is that the, um, the disruption that is about to happen is so significant that you cannot wait until tomorrow morning to think about it. That post this event, you need to go home and learn the AI tools and advance Africa forward, right? Uh, but that this disruption is not going to last, and that when anyone tells you that the exist existential threats that come in the future come as a result of AI, they don't. They come as a result of bad actors, bad humans that use AI to their benefit at the expense of all of us. And so that too you can influence. You can influence by teaching the AI to stand for us and by talking to those in power, uh, like I have dedicated my life in the last seven years or eight years, to, to tell them that we actually don't need to live the future like we've lived the past. That this scarcity mindset that has driven us here, where for me to win, my competitor has to lose, is gone. We all can win, and I think it is truly and honestly not a technological challenge anymore to create an amazing world for all of us. It's an ethical challenge. It's a morality challenge.